Hello, everybody. I'm here tonight to share with you two of the most fundamental insights of my research, of which I truly believe many more people should know about. First, humanity as a whole has, over the last couple of decades, experienced a massive and actually unprecedented transformation of moral values. Second, and even more importantly, this transformation is a good thing because it brings to the surface the better moral qualities of our species. Well, hearing that, you might think this person must live in a different reality. Haven't I heard about Brexit, Trump, rising populism, right-wing extremism, global terrorism, religious fundamentalism, and all the other indications of our moral decline? Indeed, Influential critics try to convince us since the ages that our undeniable technological progress is counteracted by a moral digression, which opens a growing discrepancy between our technological capacities and our moral qualities. The problem with the critics, however, is they never prove their point by systematic evidence to hard facts. What they usually do is cherry-picking examples that fit their claims, but leaving out others that don't. So let's try a different approach. Let's have a look at a collection of systematic data of what people from all corners around the world think is morally right or wrong. That data collection exists in several decades, so what we can do as well is look at change over time, if there is any, and then if, in what direction is it going. The data collection I'm referring to is known as the World Values Survey. If you're interested in the details on how this study is conducted, you can go at their website, which is on display here. In blue colors, we see the, the countries in the world that have been surveyed at least once by the World Value Survey. This is more than 100 countries. But more importantly, we cover in each global region the biggest national population. So we have China and Japan and East Asia. We have India and Indonesia and South Asia. We have Nigeria and South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. We have Egypt, Iran, Turkey and the Middle East. We have the US and North America, of course. We have Brazil and Argentina covered in South America and so on and so forth. So we can claim that our data represent more than 90% of the world population, which is significant. We find in these data a whole host of moral differences between people and between entire nations. But we sifted through these data since many years, and it turned out that most of these differences boil down to just two, just two key domains of cultural variation. One of them you see on the horizontal axis, where it spans a continuum from sacred to secular values. Populations on the left end emphasize the, the authority of sacred sources of authority, especially religion, but also the nation, the state, the family. Populations on the right have a secular distance to these sources of authority, especially, again, religion. The second dimension is on the vertical axis, and it spans a polarity between patriarchal and emancipative values. At the lower end, at the patriarchal end, populations emphasize male superiority over women in the areas of education, in the areas of access to jobs, and in the areas of political power. They also emphasize strict authority of parents over their children, and such things as strict discipline, law and order, and related things. Populations at the upper end, at the emancipative end, emphasize women's equality to men, child autonomy, self-determination, and democratic voice is part of what they emphasize. Now, you see there's a lot of countries covered here, 
But another interesting point is that these many nations cluster into a much smaller number of what we call culture zones, which map on these cultural differences as well, as you have seen before. We color in blue the Western cultural zones, and it's apparent that they differ from the non-Western culture zones, especially on the dimension of patriarchal versus emancipative values, where the Western culture is actually defined, in a sense, by an emphasis on emancipation much more than other cultural zones in the world. And even the Protestant West sticks even more out here. And the biggest cultural distance that we find is between the Protestant West and the Islamic world, with many people in the Islamic world emphasizing sacred values and patriarchal values, and most of the people in the Protestant West emphasizing secular values and especially emancipative values. Scholars usually consider such cultural distances or differences as a constant as enduring traits of national mentalities. This overlooks, however, how much dynamic there was over current or recent decades in these moral values. Surprisingly, all cultural zones of the world have uniformly moved in the same direction. Even the Islamic world, even in Sub-Saharan Africa, we see a movement towards more secular, and especially towards more emancipative values. On the other hand, it is also clear that the Western cultures made a much farther space on that, in that direction, so their move is even more pronounced, which means that the emancipatory outlook of Western culture is nowadays even more pronounced than it already has been decades ago. So the fact that all cultural zones are moving in the same direction does not lead to convergence. Cultural differences have actually been become bigger, which is an issue of conflict. Looking at the forces that might be driving this change towards emancipative values, we get a hint here. We see knowledge economies, which are those countries that obtain their wealth from high-end products and services. We have industrial economies, which are those countries that obtain their wealth from cheap workbench production. So those ones into which we outsource our labor a lot. And we have agrarian and oil economies obtaining their wealth from natural products and raw materials. A criterion distinguishing these, these economies is what I call the enlightenment forces, which is education, knowledge, and science. These enlightenment forces are the most pronounced, most powerful in the knowledge economies, more so than in the industrial economies, which in turn have them more powerful than the agrarian and oil economies. And here we can see that it is worthwhile to send our children into school and to universities and to college and let them enjoy education. It is a transformative force. In all three types of economies, we see that people who have obtained more education emphasize emancipative values more strongly. Again, this is more pronounced in knowledge economies where the enlightenment forces are most powerful. If you ask yourself the question, is that move towards stronger emancipative values, is this something good? Is this positive? From the viewpoint of democracy, it certainly is. Because here we can see that over the decades from 1950 to 2010, culture zones have make, made a shift from more autocratic to more democratic circumstances to about the extent to which their populations have shifted from patriarchal to emancipative values. You actually can see that oftentimes a move to the right, that means towards more emancipative values, precedes a move upward, which suggests that the value change is causal 
for the subsequent change in institutions and not the other way around. An even more fundamental reason why we can consider the rise of emancipative values as a force of enlightenment is these values' tendency to produce what I call moral universalism. That is, the widening of our circles of solidarity to an extent, to an outer rim, planet and humanity, where the concerns about these things defy group divisions, because everyone is included. Patriarchal values, by contrast, go back there, um, favor the opposite moral tendency towards moral parochialism. What is that? That means the narrowing down of the solidarity circle. My nation first, America first. These are the slogans that depict that moral tendency. And here we can see the shift from patriarchal to emancipative values is indeed related to a shift from moral parochialism to moral universalism, to the expansion of our circles of solidarity, of our empathy for others. This is measured here, for example, by environmental concern about global change and by fighting poverty in the world. So the concern for the planet and for humanity is covered here. But there are also problems. The rise of emancipative values has also created cultural conflict over moral universalism versus parochialism. And this applies to a particular segment of Western electorates. There is a segment of the population that has been left behind by the emancipatory mainstream that does not get a lot of education and accordingly is working in low-skilled manual jobs that are threatened to be outsourced to other countries. So, the working class, to simplify it. This working class in the economic conflict between social security and market competition, it's located on the left, also ideologically on the left. They are in favor of social security. And this is where usually leftist parties, social democratic parties, the democratic party in the U.S. context picks these voters up. However, on the moral conflict between universalism and parochialism, they're on the parochial end. And this is a moral conflict. This is not an economic conflict. These people want to narrow the circle of solidarity again. My nation first. Make America great again and let no immigrants in anymore, build a wall. This is parochialism, and these people are located there for reasons. And this is where now the rising forces of populism, Flams Bloc, and Front National in France, the Liberal Party in Austria, where they, including Trump in the United States, pick these people up as their voters. The other area of emerging cultural conflict over issues of emancipation is immigration. Especially immigration from non-Western populations into Western countries. I exemplify this here at the case of Germany, which is a very typical post-industrial Western society. The left bar shows that the native host population born in Germany, German citizens, they score very high on emancipative values. So 62% uh, of this population emphasizes this type of values strongly. First generation immigrants, which is the lower bar on the right side, are very, very different. They emphasize these values not even to 20% of this group, and these are immigrants from non-Western cultures. And that, of course, that creates a cultural gap over these issues. And these are important lifestyle issues, 
gender equality, tolerance of homosexuality, all these issues are related to that. Given the centrality that emancipative values have for a healthy democracy, this is not trivial. This is a challenge, and we need to face it in order to tackle it. The good news, however, is we can master that challenge because it's also obvious from the data, and these are the three bars in the middle, that second-generation immigrants already are very close in their emphasis on emancipative values that where the host population is. So obviously, socialization in this country does work. Which relates us to the point, can we strengthen the effectiveness and the pace of that socialization process? Can we do that? And this relates me to my final point, which is actually a call for action. I believe what we need to do is to thoroughly rethink our civic education programs and to target them particularly to the immigrant population. And most importantly, what we also need to do while doing this is to place the psychology of emancipative values center stage in the curriculum of these programs. <laughs>